Hi, welcome to Science Colloquium. If you are waiting for us, we will be starting at 3.15 today. And um, just be patient, just a few minutes here before we get started. Um, today we have Jamie DiRolo, who is our MJC head athletic trainer and faculty, and she's going to do a talk for us on concussions, keeping the head, keeping the head out of the game. And um, next week, well, next week, two weeks, we have Meg Kumaro from, she's the CFO of Fly the Farm, closing the gap with drones. And so we're looking at the wide world of drones and drone applications. Uh, Meg will bring grassroots knowledge to the ag drone scene and a grower focus um, on the grain industry. There's going to be a discussion of the use of drone technology to improve productivity, profitability, um, and I believe also they're looking at um, water usage. So um, please join us for that. And I believe, yeah, that talk is actually going to be coming to us from Australia. So really fabulous that Meg's going to be joining us from Australia. I'm, I'm not sure we've figured out exactly what our time gap is with that, but um, join us in two weeks for that one, okay? Thank you. And we are just going to get started in another minute. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And then Jill, if you want to just go ahead and take it away at it's 314 right now. I think it's, it's okay to start if you want. Okay. All right, I'm gonna introduce Jamie to us. So Jamie De DiRolo um, returned to MJC in 2016 as the head athletic trainer and a faculty member, teaching their sports medicine students and providing healthcare to their 21 athletic teams. Um, prior to that, Jamie was the head AT at San Joaquin Delta College for almost nine years. She has worked in the high school and clinic settings and has had the opportuni opportunity to work um, the World Special Olympics in Los Angeles in the summer of 2016, which is pretty cool. Um, Jamie completed her doctorate of athletic training degree at Temple University in 2018, where she focused her critically appraised topic on mental health, medications, and the neurocognitive effects on sports performance. She earned her master's of business administration from South University in healthcare administration and graduated from CSU Fresno with a Bachelor of Science in Kinesiology with an emphasis in athletic training. Uh, before Fresno, she uh, was at MJC where she played soccer and she got into the athletic training field and graduated um, from there with both an Associate of Arts and an Associate of Science degree. Jamie serves as the two-year institution chair for the Intercollegiate Council on Sports Medicine, um, the par parliamentarian for the California Athletic Trainers Association, and is the sports representative chair and Big 8 AT representative for the California Community College Athletic Trainers Association. So um, aside from that, Jamie and her husband reside in Riverbank, they have a son and two daughters who are all very active in sports, um, Girl Scouts and the Navy Sea Cadets. Uh, so today we have the privilege of hearing Jamie speak on concussions. Um, the CDC <clears throat> estimates that 1.6 to 3.8 million concussions occur in sports and recreational activities annually. Um, and there's, there's uh, these figures may be vastly underestimated um, as many individuals don't seek medical advice. So um, concussions have become a hot topic both on and off the field of play. So Jamie DeBrolo will discuss concussions and current practices and how to evaluate and treat concussions. So welcome, Jamie. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. So we'll get right into it, guys. 
um, like they've already introduced, we're talking about concussions today and how to keep the head out of the game. Uh, I do have not, I don't have any disclosures or conflicts of interest to disclose, but wanted to let you guys know, I know this is being recorded and can be viewed at a future date. Uh, I do want to disclose that this information is only current up through March 2021. Um, if we're going by the ever-changing you know, knowledge and data that we have on everything, what I learned 20 years ago in school is completely different than what we're talking about now. So I just want to kind of reiterate that um, it's current now, but who knows what the future holds. So today, after watching this with us, you guys will be able to recognize signs and symptoms of a concussion, be able to describe a concussion and what CTE is, and identify ways to prevent and treat concussions. So, you know, this is a rhetorical question. I can't hear you guys or anything, but what is a concussion? You know, have, have you had any type of experience or exposure? Are we able to see concussions? Um, I know all too often coaches were used to seeing, you know, a contusion of the leg or a sprained ankle and the swelling and the edema that goes on with it. But with a concussion, we can't necessarily see that. Okay. And so it's really hard for um, anyone who's not gone through it or hasn't sustained a concussion to understand. Um, and then also we'll talk a little bit about, does everyone have the same knowledge about concussions? Uh, are we up to date and current with what the current data and research has told us? Uh, and, you know, every month there's new journal articles that are coming out, peer reviewed journal articles that are helping us better provide healthcare to our patients. My patient and my patient population happen to be student athletes. And then what do we know about concussions? I know there are a lot of myths that I will hopefully bust for you guys um, and kind of give you some insight on what to do if and when you come across this. All right, so what is a concussion? Concussions occur from forces applied directly or indirectly to the skull in acceleration and deceleration. Okay, so the technical term for a concussion is pathophysiological disruption of the brain, right? Um, there is a sudden change in the velocity that can elicit neurological shearing, and we will go into that a little bit further. Um, we all know that the brain is complex. So I do wanna show just a couple of highlights or not so highlights of concussions. I didn't hyperlink that right, so I apologize. But what you would see on here is um, kind of the wow factor. And it's not just football that it occurs in. Um, hawk, any type of collision sport and, um, you know, motor vehicle accidents, things like that. Uh, I know in the military, when we're talking about concussions or MTBIs, mild traumatic brain injury, that um, they they do sustain concussions out in the field with different explosives or situations that can and do arise. All right, there is an evolving knowledge of concussions. Like I've said before, it's completely different as what I was taught in undergrad. And that's because there's been more studies done on it, more research, um, more publicity. So one of the things that we're trying to educate coaches, parents, student athletes is to change the vernacular. You know, before it was okay to talk about, oh, you just got your bell rung, you know, rub some dirt on it, you're good to go, okay? Or you just got a ding, a little dinger, humdinger, you're, you're good to go. So we need to kind of educate everybody on what concussions are, that it is a traumatic brain injury, there is a disruption in the brain, and not to kind of push it aside. Um, in the past, I think it was potentially pushed aside because you can't really see a concussion. There is a change in knowledge of concussions. We no longer have to have loss of consciousness in order to have sustained a concussion and we no longer grade the concussions. Back in the day, we used to first, second, third degree, um, but we no longer grade them because it, it is evolving as far as what's going on inside the brain on a pathophysiological um, level. 
And then we're also changing in the treatment. And I'll get to that later on in my presentation. But part of that change in treatment, before we used to completely rest student athletes until all their signs and symptoms were completely gone from a concussion. But we don't treat knee sprains like that. We don't treat shoulder separations like that. Um, and then with the, the, the ever-changing study of concussions, there has been studies that have come out and said, we don't need to rest them until all their signs or symptoms are completely gone, but we can progress them back in as long as their signs and symptoms aren't increasing. Okay, and I'll get to that a little bit later on. All right, who is at risk? Okay, youth, youth are at higher risk. One, because they don't have the musculature to um, maybe keep up with or sustain forceful uh, changes in acceleration, deceleration. Um, there could have been improper training. And when we're talking about improper training, we're talking about how to tackle, how to hit, how to, and, and you know, with volleyball, how there's actually a right or wrong way to fall. And you wanna fall in with the momentum. So you're not kind of forcing it or potentially jarring um, the head, head, hand, or neck. So improper training. So there's trainings and it's not just for football and tackling. It can be in any sport to try and limit and prevent injuries from occurring. Collision sports are at much higher risk just because of the nature of the sport. And we'll get into that a little bit later when I talk about how there have been rule changes um, for many different types of sports, one of which is soccer in that they no longer allow heading the soccer ball if you're 13 or younger. Um, and then older, you're only supposed to do it in games. So different things like that can help minimize and reduce those risks of potential concussion, but that's something that we need to educate everybody on. St athletes are bigger, stronger, faster. So the collision and velocity in which they hit each other can have more of an impact. Um, and with that, there is potential more trauma. Those that have been in motor vehicle or other accidents have a higher risk. You don't have to have hit your head, just the head jarring back and forth. Um, falling or in abuse have higher risk. And then if you've had a previous concussion, there is a higher risk of you sustaining another concussion or the potential for you to sustain another concussion. All right, so looking at this, a concussion can occur if you did get hit in the head, okay? There are two different things. One is a coup injury where right where you were hit, it's affecting the brain. There's swelling and a contusion of the brain. Or there's a contra coup where maybe you, you hit here, but the damage to the brain is here, okay? So coup, contra coup. Um, you guys can read that, you know, at, at your leisure, but we sh it should be noted that the brain is really complex right? Uh, the human body, it, the brain is a three pound organ that, um, what do I want to say? Three pound organ that is a seat of an intelligence database of memories and interpreter of senses, uh, the director of movement lying in a bony shell of our skull, okay? Um, there is the cerebral spinal fluid that helps protect the fluid in the brain, but the brain is fragile. Um, if you guys have seen the movie Concussion, they, there's a great scene in there where it basically has eggs inside of a jar, the eggs aren't cooked, and then they shake it around. So it, it's kind of simulating um, what happens within that cerebral spinal fluid. Um, the brain has over 100 billion nerve cells called neurons sending electrical and chemical signals to and from the body. And each neuron has a cell body that is a long nerve fiber I think I have a picture of it. Yep, there we go. So it has a long nerve fiber um, called an axon and projections of the cell body called dendrites where you can see right here. Oh, I don't even have my little thing. Laser pointer, here we go, the little dendrites. Okay, dendrites extend out from the cell body to receive messages from other ner nerve cell axons and the brain connects neurons with each other which in turn provide extensive interconnections in between the areas of the brain. And because the, the brain and the neurons and the nerves are so fragile, the sudden rapid movement of the head can cause injury that I was talking about before with coup, contra coup, um, as far as the acceleration and deceleration within the skull, okay? 
Um, the impact of the injury could be violent enough that it will potentially cause swelling and bruising of the brain tissue. Although, um, and we would potentially call that a con contusion of the brain, but there are other cases where there are low speed coup contra coup and the, the damage might not be visible to the eye. It might not also have those signs and symptoms that um, show up immediately. And that's why when we evaluate, we also reevaluate after 15 to 20 minutes to make sure there wasn't a delay in um, you know, the damage that can, could have been visible. Um, the brain will slide when there's that um, acceleration, deceleration, the brain can slide over itself at different speeds and the axon that crosses the different junctions will experience shearing forces. And with those shearing forces, it'll cause them to stretch and tear from the cell body. So these right here would stretch, then they're no longer kind of connected and that's where we have cellular death. So um, that event is actually called axonal shearing and, or it could be also called diffuse axonal injury brain damage that um, it can occur immediately or you know, several minutes to hours later. So that's why we reevaluate after the fact. And then we also give our patients or student athletes um, signs and symptoms and things to look for. And not necessarily the patient that has or that we suspect has a concussion, maybe their roommate or a parent because again, they have a brain injury. They may not necessarily remember all these instructions that you happen to be giving them. Um, there are severe cases of diffuse axonal injury that can result in coma and could put people in, could put a person in a vegetative state. Um, there are potential long-term effects for damage of the brain and that the other healthcare providers would need to use either a CT or an MRI, I'm sorry, CT, a commuted tomography or an MRI, magnetic resonance imaging, that they can help check for the TBIs, but it's not necessary for everybody just to go straight to the emergency room. Some signs and symptoms of a concussion. Okay, headache is usually the, the number one. Although if you talk to rugby athletes, hockey, football, um, occasionally even wrestling, sometimes they say it's normal for them to have a headache all the time. Okay, that's not normal, you know, trying to throw that out there to them. But headache, they could have ringing in the ears, sensitivity to light or noise, nauseous, vomiting. They could be very lethargic, blurred vision. They could be dizzy. Um, there's been times where I've seen athletes get up and they have the kind of drunk walk. Um, and, you know, that's back in the day where people would say, oh, they got their bell rung. No, that's that could be a, a brain injury and that's something that we need to pull them aside and evaluate. Some other signs and symptoms can feel like they could be confused or feeling as if they're in a fog. Um, I kind of explain it where um, when I'm looking at them, the lights are on, but nobody's home. It's kind of a, a glossy stare. Um, they could be dizzy or um, complain that they're seeing stars or specks. It just really depends on where the damage was or where the hit was in the brain and what uh, is affected or you know, what part of the brain was affected. Then they could also potentially experience amnesia. There's two different types of amnesia. There's retrograde amnesia and anterograde amnesia. And this is a great picture. Um, so if you were to look at the time of the injury, they, they could potentially have retrograde amnesia, meaning they don't remember what happened prior to the injury. Um, you know, if I ask them what play were they running or what route were they supposed to run, they may not remember that. Okay, so that would be a good example of retrograde amnesia. Whereas anterograde amnesia is new memories. So um, there's times where um, I've had a patient where they've asked what happened and I explain it to them and then a couple minutes later, well, what, what's going on? What happened? Why am I here? Um, so they, you know, that's a good example of anterograde amnesia. So depending on what they can remember either before and after. And when I talk about how we determine if they have sustained a concussion, um, we do assess um, for memories prior to and then memories after um, to help determine if they are have sustained any type of amnesia. There are others that might be occasional signs and symptoms. They may not be, um, you know, for every, not every single person goes through these, but it should be noted 
because they can coincide with a concussion. Um, they could have a loss of consciousness. It doesn't always occur. So you don't have to lose consciousness in order to have stain, sustained a concussion. There's times, um, you know, where I'm jogging out onto the field, somebody's gone down and I can hear them sawing logs. They are completely 100% unconscious. So with that, we also suspect a spinal cord issue and we'll hold inline spine mobilization until either EMS gets there or until the, the patient wakes up and we'll you know, calm them down and go through the process as far as um, what's going on. But a lot of times, those patients happen to be really scared because you know they don't remember, they don't think that they were knocked out or that they were unconscious. People can also have slurred speech, um, delayed response to questions. As far as I might have asked them a question and then um, had another conversation, they're like, "Oh yeah, this." So there could be kind of a delay where um, you know it's not always connecting with the speech and cognition of what they were thinking. The dazed appearance is what I was talking about before. The lights are on, but nobody's home. They could be forgetful and repeatedly asking the same question. Um, they're not doing it to be annoying. It's that's, they don't remember, okay? All right, I wanna get into a little bit of myth busters because I do know, you know, there's a lot of misinformation out there or maybe outdated information. You no longer have to wake up somebody every couple of hours, you know, before, and I know I've, I still see it sometimes in uh, movies where, oh, we think they sustained a concussion. Make sure, you know, you wake them up every couple of hours because we don't want them slipping into a coma. That is a myth. Um, and actually with concussions, if somebody has sustained a concussion, we encourage them to sleep. Um, we want them to rest and rest their brain as much as possible, which in this day and age, it, it's difficult to do. You know, everybody's on their phone or on a screen. And that's the worst thing you can do for a concussion. I actually had a patient who um, changed his whole entire demeanor. He didn't even realize he had had a con concussion um, and he was very happy-go-lucky um, and ended up dropping an F-bomb and just totally out of character and really wanted his helmet back. So um, it, there, there can be different signs and symptoms, but we do, and he was coming back really well, progressing in our five day return to play program. Um, between day four and day five, day five, he comes back into the athletic treatment center. And um, it was like he had just gotten hit all over again. So I had to talk to him and found out that he's a video gamer and he was playing video games for two hours the night before. And, you know, it delayed his progress and we had to kind of start from square one. So we don't need to wake up the patients every couple of hours make sure they sleep, try not to have them on any small devices or, um, you know, and have them rest as much as possible. You don't have to go to the emergency room. Um, I'm a parent and I know you don't mess with mama bear or papa bear. If mom or dad wants to go to the doctor, that's fine. Um, it, you know, I do try and give them education, excuse me, on what to look for, signs and symptoms, worsening of signs and symptoms, if they start vomiting, um, but a lot of times with the emergency room and, and now with COVID and everything, people aren't, um, necessarily wanting to go to the emergency room, but they also don't have to, as long as the signs and symptoms aren't worsening. Um, NSAIDs, NSAIDs stand for non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, um, basically Aleve, Advil, Ibuprofen, um, and I actually, you know, one of my family friends, his, his son took a line drive um, to the head and sustained a concussion. They took him to the emergency room and the emergency, and this is only um, probably within the, the last two months, the emergency room, obviously out of California, but the emergency room prescribed him um, 800 milligrams of ibuprofen which we really don't want the patients to have an anti-inflammatory because it helps thin the blood. And what a, con what a concussion is, is basically like a contused brain, a, a bruise. And when you, when you thin the blood, you have the potential of um, kind of expanding that bruise. So we wanna make sure that we're checking in on those patients even after, if they have gone to the ER and followed up 
because sometimes they're not necessarily getting the correct or most current up-to-date advice. Um, we no longer talk about getting your bell rung. And then also um, you don't have to have a loss of consciousness and or uh, you know some people are like, well, I didn't vomit. So I thought I didn't have a concussion. So all of those are um, untrue. And um, probably one of the biggest ones is before, you know, people used to think, oh, well, I didn't lose consciousness, so I'm fine. It's not, it's not a brain injury, which it still could be, even if you didn't lose consciousness. Um, there are some problems within the medical field. And some of the problems are that there are new emerging research and technologies, which lend sight to a continuing ev evolution of care but not everybody is up to date and current. Um, I'll admit this past year uh, for me has been focusing all on COVID and educating myself to educate the coaches and the student athletes, what to look for, what to do, how to treat um, and how to return safely to um, conditioning and then eventually sport. So, um, you know, I, that had been my sole focus. Now getting back into athletic training, um, making sure I'm staying current and I, for this red, you know, four or five brand new articles that came out within the last two months about concussions. And the, the research is needed and it's, it's great, but there is a variation of knowledge within the healthcare providers managing concussions. Um, I actually go in and have taught some of um, basically on the field assessment for concussion evaluation to uh, medical residents um, locally. And that's because, you know, I'm, I'm in the mix of it and see and treat it all the time and trying to give some words of wisdom and knowledge to um, young healthcare professionals that will be doing it. Um, so physicians, physician assistants, nurse practitioners, chiropractors, athletic trainers, school nurses, we all have our own niche and focus. Um, mine is predominantly sports medicine uh, related to sports injuries and illnesses. Um, if you ask me about any type of internal or trying to um, crack backs or anything like that, nope, I'm referring you out. Let's send you to somebody who that's what they went to school specifically for. Yeah, I have basic knowledge on that, but I would much rather um, have them have the best health care possible to try and get them back to achieving their goals. Um, some of the other problems in the medical field, keeping up with current practice. Okay, so um, I went and looked. Um, the NATA, National Athletic Trainers Association, they have a position statement, but that came out in 2014. Um, and when I was working on my doctorate a couple of years ago, that was already out of date by 2016, okay? Because new research and everything has come out. Um, the consensus, there was a fifth consensus um, in October 2016, which they came up with a new SCAT-5 on how to evaluate on the field. Um, but again, now we're several years later, um, but these are kind of the, the gold standard documents um, and what most likely other healthcare providers are, are reading and researching, but there is new research that's come out since, even though you know these are great references, but more things have come out since then and we need something new. The other problem is COVID-19, you know, that's, that's, a lot of people don't want to go to the emergency rooms or get care because of fear for being exposed. So that is a, a problem in that patients that may possibly need to get treated or have additional diagnostic tests done, they're not going. Um, although we, we also, because of COVID-19, we don't have many sports going on, at least in California. Um, so the incidence of concussion is most likely down. There are problems for the student athletes, okay? And some of those problems are post-concussion syndrome or second impact syndrome. So 85 to 90% of um, patients who sustain a concussion get uh, results, um, get results, sorry. They get um, their signs and symptoms are alleviated. Those that last longer than two weeks were worried about with post-concussion syndrome. And unfortunately, I have had a couple of patients where they actually had to um, you know, alter their um, class load because of the cognition and unable to retain um, information. So um, that, and then second impact. Second impact is a fear of mine in that 
Maybe somebody, a patient of mine wouldn't disclose that they had a concussion or, um, you know, maybe fibbed about their signs and symptoms and feeling better. And then we put them back potentially in the game. And if they sustain a second impact before the first one was completely healed, then we run the risk of potential death. Okay. So it is serious. Um, and that's another reason why I'm constantly trying to educate uh, not only my athletic training students, but the coaches and the student athletes. Uh, I, I'm fortunate in that, you know, I had a coach come up to me back when we had games where he, you know, he said, hey, check out so-and-so, he's not acting right. And some of the questions that I ask are, you know, orientation questions. And I asked, you know, where are you at? What color are your eyes? Who's the name of your head coach? All this stuff. And um, the kid told me it was Friday and he was in Turlock. Well, that would have been true last year when you were in high school and you played Friday night football at Turlock High or at Pittman High, but now it's Saturday and we're at MJC. So, um, and the, this patient or the student was adamant that, you know, he was correct. So that's kind of some things that can happen um, and, and the kind of changes for a brain injury. There are potential injury, or I'm sorry, problems for administrators where everything is a few mouse clicks away. And there's a lot of, um, this was four or five years ago where in Colorado, Wyoming and nationwide, they're trying to do a class action lawsuit to high schools or to colleges or to the NFL or whoever, if you sustained a concussion and um, you know, we're worried about, you know, and I've gotten, you know, uh, it wasn't one of my patients, but I've gotten called in asking, well, did, why didn't they baseline test? Baseline testing has only been around, I wanna say seven, eight years, and it has it, you know, and become the norm. But before that, baseline test wasn't done. We didn't know to do that. That wasn't um, standard practice of care. So um, we're worried about, you know, litigation. And then the extent of the problem. The professional athletes get a ton of attention and exposure and experience. They have um, better access to healthcare. Um, whereas when you start trickling down to the lower levels, uh, even high school or recreation, they may not necessarily have access to healthcare or have um, somebody who can identify. And some of that has been rectified. It's um, mandated that high school coaches have to take a concussion course. Um, and things to try and educate them to educate the patients. And then, you know, concussions are more common in school due to in high school because of the increased numbers. So this is a good graphic and it's trying, I'm basically trying to show you guys, it's not just a football problem. Yeah, we really, a lot of times people will associate concussions with football, but it's just a, as high or, you know, potential for males and females. And actually, um, I think I have a statistic on one of the other pages that females have a higher rate of incidence of concussion. Um, we don't know if it's because they disclose or if it's because the strength of the neck musculature isn't there. But, um, you know, 33% of all high school sport concussions happen during practice. And, you know, there are a lot of times in which schools may not have access to um, the school nurse after hours or to an athletic trainer. So these are things that is now being put upon the coaches and or parents to be able to identify. Um, this is a very old statistic, but I, I liked it in showing that um, behind football was girls soccer. Um, and, part, and this was also before there was rule changes as far as heading the ball and whatnot. But um, you know, even sports that you wouldn't necessarily think would sustain a concussion, like softball, um, it can and does happen. Uh, the extent of the concussion problem, it's not just football. We need to make sure we're educating coaches, student athletes. That way they can report, they can either disclose to themselves or to others. Um, I know we don't really have women's ice ho or ice hockey period in California, but the statistics on, on the right was um, pretty alarming that 50 to 80% of concussions may go unreported. A lot of times our um, patients or the student athletes are afraid of reporting because they're fearful for losing playing time or they got to play in that game. It's, 
you know, is it my team's counting on me? And I have to remind our patients that, yeah, it, it's important, but it's not that important. This is your brain. You need to be able to, um, you know, have a job, pick up your kit, you know, be able to hold your child. Oh, I'm never having kids. Okay, you're missing the point, you know. Um, it is, this is from University of Delaware, but um, when you have the same sports, women have a higher instance rate of concussion. We don't, like I said before, we don't know if it's because they're disclosing or if it has to do with the neck musculature or, or what, but um, it's something to be concerned about. And there's more studies that are coming out. Reporting people might not want to report. And then also we are um, teaching everybody about return to learn and return to play. Before in the sports medicine world, the focus was on return to play. Well, think about it. Most of our patient population are student athletes. So we need to first make sure that they're able to get back into the classrooms. Um, and sometimes it's working with like our DSPS office and, and making a temporary disability because that's what a concussion is. Hopefully it is just temporary, but there is the potential for, um, you know, it being a prolonged so this is an NC2A study, it's now old in 2014, but looking at the hardest hits, and now there are different helmets that will uh, report the velocity and the number of hits and where the hits were at in the helmet. And that's all good information, but that's just one sport. We need to make sure we're looking at those other sports. Um, looking at the numbers, there's 1.6 million and 3.8 million related uh, recreation related concussions that occur annually nationwide. Okay, those are heavy numbers. Um, and who's to say that those numbers are accurate? You know, are, is everybody reporting? Not everybody's going to the emergency room. They don't need to go to the emergency room, but um, we need to make sure that we are, we, we educate ourselves and we know what's going on to help um, you know, look out for the interest of the, our, our youth. What's the big deal? So there has been an increase in awareness. Um, people are disclosing more. So I don't know if there's necessarily more concussions that are occurring or now we know more about it and we are reporting it more, but there have been several high, high profile athletes. I pulled the Muhammad Ali since that just, it was like the 50 year anniversary or something a couple days ago. Um, Dale Jr., it's a NASCAR guy, and he actually was in a pretty significant car crash, and um, he was a huge advocate and, and was, you know, one of the most popular athletes in that particular sport, and he flat out told the sport association that he's not going to return to NASCAR until they have a concussion policy in place, which, you know, definitely helps when it trickles down to all the, the lower levels. Um, that and then we have knowledge and we know the long-term effects that are potential for people who have sustained concussions. Um, the other thing, there's high profile cases in 2015, 14, the movie uh, Concussion came out with Will Smith. Um, if you haven't seen it, I highly recommend you guys watching it. Um, it's very accurate besides, um, the accent Will Smith does, but the only reason I would know that is because um, that gentleman in the center is Dr. Bennett Omalu, who um, actually is local to us in Modesto. He uh, lives in Lodi and works at San Joaquin General um, and was kind of the one, one of the main ones um, when identifying CTE. And then also the media, the media portrays concussions and will start bringing out and, and saying different things as far as um, you know, oh, I think you may have a concussion, the, specta the uh, announcers. So things to think about in there. CTE stands for chronic traumatic encephalopathy. Okay, that's definitely a uh, mouthful. Um, and uh, Dr. Amalo is one that coined the term. And right here, what we're looking at are good examples. There's a normal brain and brain tissue on the left-hand side. And then on the middle is a 45-year-old former NFL athlete, and in the far right is a 73-year-old boxer. Well, you think about it, boxing, the goal of the sport is to give somebody else a concussion and they're knocked out, okay? So what uh, CT is, is um, basically describing brain degeneration. 
um, caused by repeated head traumas. Unfortunately, it's a diagnosis that is only made at autopsy when you study the brain and look at it under a microscope. So there's still a lot to be learned from it, but experts are still trying to understand how repeated head traumas, including the number of head injuries people have had, what could contribute to them potentially having CTE. Um, it's been found in brains of football and other contact sports, um, boxing, MMA, um, and I think the next one, yeah, this is an 18 year old high school athlete who only had only, who only had two documented concussions. He did play multiple sports um, and at autopsy, they're already seeing these changes. Um, so we're trying to be on top of that and cognizant of that, but there is no diagnosis um, until autopsy. So there's things where they could surmise that they may have it, but you know, it's not um, solidified until basically it's too late. The NFL has made great changes where they are, let me see how I'm doing on time, okay. Where um, once they finally acknowledged what concussions were, um, you know, they are trying to repair the damage that they have done by trying to um, brush it under the rug. Um, they have hired independent neurologists to make return to play decisions. So. Um, it's not somebody who's hired by that particular team. It's an independent, no affiliation, no association. So they're not worried about um, their livelihood or being paid. There is also no return to play the same game in most cases. And they have ha hired um, outside athletic trainers that are not affiliated with either team to be what's called the eye in the sky. Um, and it's changed. It used to be, you know, one person and now sometimes there's multiple athletic trainers or, um, you know, one or two athletic trainers and then all the tech guys that are up in the box where they can replay different visuals because, yeah, you know, this is a huge hit and you can see that, but a lot of times there's stuff that's going on off the ball that we need to be conscientious of. And that eye in the sky will call down to whatever sideline and say, hey, check number 26 out you know, um, you might have had something. And so it's another way to have a checks and balances for that. Um, once that happened, NC2A followed suit in 2009. They kind of said no return to play the same day of a concussion. Um, and now it's even gone on more than that. There's a um, return to play uh, progression when they're in sport before they can go back. Um, and then we also need to remind student athletes that, you know, in the 2009 Super Bowl, the quarterbacks um, didn't play or return to play because of concussion. So really, how important is your high school Friday night football game? You know, when now it's being shown that if they have sustained a concussion, they're not returning on, you know, probably the biggest event of their life. So we need to kind of put it in perspective to the student athletes. Um, National Federation of High School Sports Medicine Athletic Committee, they have changed rules um, there. And then also in the NFL, there's no spearing, no helmet to helmet contact um, with wrestling. Wrestling before you used to only have a minute and a half injury time. And now that has changed to, um, we can have unlimited time and we can move them into an area where it's quieter. So we can um, give a full thorough evaluation if we do suspect a concussion. Um, and then again, at the high school level, they now are no, and even if an official thinks that somebody, a student athlete has sustained a concussion, they can pull them out and that person cannot return to play until they're cleared by a healthcare professional, which is looking out for the health and safety of our youth. Um, 2011 rule change, basically saying that they're not able to return to sport until they've been evaluated by a healthcare professional, could be an athletic trainer, could, you know, any healthcare professional, um, ideally somebody who is knowledgeable in concussions. We're educating coaches anytime that they're in doubt, we should sit them out. And um, at the high school level, they are taking, uh, they have to take a concussion course where they take a, you know, watch videos, take a quiz, learn the signs and symptoms, and then they get a certificate. Um, staying ahead of the issue. We need to make sure that um, we're not letting the students back into participation unless they have been cleared. 
and if they have sustained a concussion that they're having a progression of return to learn and return to play. In 2014, there was AB 2127 that um, required a concussed athlete to have a graduated return to play of at least seven days. And this is what I was talking about. These two links are different um, certificates you can get for concussion. Um, it's good for anybody who is not necessarily in the medical field uh, to at least be conscientious and aware. Um, both one's 20 minutes, one's 21 minutes. But uh, you watch the videos, you learn the signs and symptoms, you take a quiz. It's something that I make all of my athletic training students do. And it's something that they can put on their resume that'll set them apart from others. Beyond education and policy, so rules, reinforcing the rules. I've talked about soccer no longer um, can head the ball, uh, no spearing in football or head direct helmet to helmet contact. Um, the wrestling where we now can pull them aside and do a thorough evaluation for um, cheer. There's a lot of stunts and things that go on. There's a law now that for the bigger tournaments in California, um, most people are, are hiring athletic trainers for these tournaments to be able to have a healthcare provider on site to be able to evaluate and determine, you know, if it's safe for that particular person to, to return. Some of the things that we do um, is neuropsychologic testing. Most of them are computerized. There's some at the bottom. No, I don't get paid for any of them. But what we do here is give them a baseline on all the athletes. And I like the computerized programs because it can tell if you're trying to cheat the system as far as in your delayed response. But I like to have a baseline because, um, you know, it's good to know where people stand and we want to test them when they don't have any type of brain injury. So, Right now, really, you know, think of, you know, can you repeat the months of the year in reverse order, starting with December? Okay, maybe you can, maybe you can't. But if you can't, it's not fair for me to take points away from you if you couldn't do it even without a concussion. So that's another reason why baseline testing is important. Um, 12 cranial nerves. No, I don't need, you know, I'm not quizzing you guys on this, but there's different good mnemonics that will help you and, and also to determine if it is a motor or sensory or both for each of the different nerves. But when we're evaluating a concussion there on the field, we're doing different things for their orientation, for their immediate memory, for their delayed recall. Remember retrograde and anterograde amnesia? We're also telling them, you know, finding out what their concentration is. Um, and then giving them guidance on what to do. You know, we don't want them to consume any alcohol or any medications containing alcohol because that thins your blood and could make it worse. Um, they can still take their prescription drugs, but we wanna make sure that they're not taking NSAIDs. If anything, they can take acetaminophen or Tylenol because that will probably help with the headache. Um, this is part of what we do in, for our um, baseline and then return to play. Um, I do change the words because sometimes some of the knuckleheads will remember, you know, the, the five words of the year or whatnot. Saddle Blue 7 Jane Tree. No, we, we've changed it this year. So um, we don't want them to cheat them, the system, but we want to make sure we are getting a good, accurate, objective measurements for this. Um, baseline testing, kind of what I was talking about with those computerized testing, clinical evaluation, then we would do a gradual return to play. If they've been out for X amount of time, we're not going to let them go back in and play a game. We want to progress it and then making sure we're continuing our education and awareness. I'm starting to run out of time, guys, so I'll go a little bit faster, but prevention, um, making sure helmets fit, making sure they're, they have the... Um, correct testing or that they've been refurbished correctly. Um, this middle one is a soccer headgear. Some people love it, some people don't. Um, but one of the bigger things would be making sure that they're wearing mouthpieces that are fitted properly and are the correct um, distance or thickness back by the molars because that that's the only joint in our head that absorbs some of the shock and can kind of help um, with that. that. And then I'll go back with um, helmets. There's no such thing as a concussion proof helmet, but there are newer helmet technologies that are out there that can help reduce the likelihood, but it's not going to completely prevent it. 
all these different organizations have had time and money that have done effects on the different ruling and research for data on concussions. And the sports organizations have made rule changes as well. It's not just um, you know, the big associations, the individual sports associations are doing that, um, which is good. And you know, people might say, oh, you're taking the fun out of the game or, or whatever the case may be, but it's still very important because uh, you know, we need to protect the brains, especially of those of our youth, because they're still developing. There have been equipment changes, uh, return to play and return to learn. There's different things where we will progress them into getting back to sport. Um, but first and foremost, we really should be more concerned with return to learn because, you know, they do need their brain to get on with life and, and hopefully make a livelihood and, and everything else with that. Um, so conclusion, making sure we educate, we can recognize some of the signs and symptoms of a concussion. Um, if you don't know, ask a healthcare provider. Um, right now, there's, you know, there are some legislation with concussion management where they do have to be evaluated and some might see it as a hassle, but at the same time, it's gonna be uh, beneficial for everybody involved because we want to protect the, the brain, get the head out of the game. And with that, I do have a ton of resources. Not that you guys wanna go ahead and read that. I do have additional information where there's YouTube links or whatnot. I'll try and see if we can post that for you guys. Um, and then if you guys have any questions, questions, comments, concerns, um, I'm not, a, you know, if I don't know the answer, I can get back to you, but hopefully I do. I thought that was great, Jamie. Um, thank you so much for that, for your talk today. Um, Jill, um, what do you, are you thinking, do you have any questions? I actually have really quick, I have one question. Um, you said soccer, no more heading the ball. Um, is that across the, is that just colleges? Is that professional? So um, no more heading the ball, that's for 13 and under. And then depending on what state you're in and what those rules are, um, you have to refer to those, those different state mandates and legislation, but usually like 13 to 18, really they wanna discourage it and or only for game situation. But my issue with that is they don't know how to do it properly and then they could end up getting injured. So let's just take it out all the way. But yeah, and the pros, um, that's kind of gone you know, by the wayside. They still are able to and do head the ball, but they also have stronger neck musculature and other things that hopefully will help limit the potential for concussions. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, I didn't know about that. So that's yeah. that's really interesting. Um, so Jill, do you want to, what do you think? Right now, nobody's posted. Any of you guys out there, do you guys have any questions you want to add to the chat? I, I have a question. You, you said uh, their neck musculature might not be strong enough or whatever. Do they knowing that, um, are there certain exercises that are encouraged in order to like increase that muscle mass? Yes. So, and I know, and I see it all the time. Well, when we did have sports, <laughs> but, um, when, you know, football was practicing, um, and even at the high school levels, I would, you know, driving by, I would see they would partner up and they're already wearing their helmets and somebody would just put you know, a little bit of force and, and the other person would try and, and, and do a isometric contraction in all directions to help strengthen that. There are different machines at different gyms that you can do to help strengthen it. Um, but yeah, there's several research studies that have talked about specifically the difference in musculature between men and women of the neck. And maybe that's why there's a higher incidence for females because um, you know, that, that strength difference for that neck musculature. Interesting. All right, guys. 
Well, I'm open for any questions, comments. Feel free to email me if, if you know, need any further follow up. Um, I'm passionate about athletic training and sports medicine. Um, I'm always trying to educate um, our student athletes and, you know, even at my kids' schools about uh, concussions and what to look for and signs and symptoms because we do want to protect that brain. Um, we want to, them to live long, healthy lives and not have to have any type of sustained negative repercussions from a brain injury. Well, that was awesome. I really appreciate it. I have a feeling you're going to have some questions that get emailed to you. Um, we still have some folks. Oh, wait, we have a question. Oh, my gosh. Um, I, I'm sure that other people are going to have questions and they're going to get back to you. There's still still several people watching the program. Um, there's a question from Denise Godbout Avant, and her, her or she might have been out of comment. This was a wonderful talk. I learned so much. Um, we'll have a grandnephew see the recording of this since he's in high school and he plays football and is a wrestler. So, yep. yeah. Anyway. No, that's awesome. Um, and also, you know, when we have uh, football games here, I always go and talk with the EMTs and do what's called a medical timeout. And because they, you know, this is not their, their niche. They, um, they may or may not work football games. So trying to educate them on what we're looking for, signs and symptoms. We also have the conversation as far as, okay, what's your guys' policy? Are we taking off equipment helmet? Or, you know, are we taking equipment off on site? Or is that what you guys do in the emergency room? Um, and it really depends on what county you're in and what those guidelines are. So um, hopefully you guys did get some information about concussions. Um, I tried not to get too medical terminology on you guys. Um, so I appreciate that comment and I'm hoping more will be able to watch this at a later date. Um, and if you guys are interested, those, and I'm, I don't get any kickbacks or anything like that, but those concussion certificates, it's only you know 20 minutes of your life and it can help um, later on down the road. So. Um, something that I do think could help and might be important for depending on your setting and situation. Well, thank you for doing this for us today. I really enjoyed your talk and um, maybe we can get you back again in the future on another subject because I have a feeling you've got quite a few. Um, so that's terrific. Um, also, everybody, I just want to invite you to come back in two weeks again, well, same time, 315, and we're going to have Meg Kumaro from um, Flying the Farm talking about dr um, drone usage and agriculture. So that's all for today, and thank you so much. Have a good evening, you guys. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Bye.